Jason, do you mind just open this room? So, Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you've given to us, Lord. Lord, thank you for each one here. Be with everyone here, Lord. Be with those that can't make it, those that have needs, those that are health problems, Father, or family problems. Lord, there are many of them right now. We pray that you would be with each and every one of them. You know our situation for each one of us better than even we know, Lord. And just let your will be upon us. And let your will and your spirit move upon this yeah. congregation this morning, yeah. Lord. Let the truth be spoken to yeah. the world, so that all ears would hear it and all eyes would be open to see it. Yeah. And we just thank you for all you've done. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
He's not here, but he's the biggest talk of the house. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he did really well, and he's a little older than most of his peers in there, so I think God has used him to be like a uh, an encourager to the people around him. And it's, it's weird because I knew all along. I, I told her before he left, he's he's a little older. I was 18 when I went in. He's he went in at 22. And uh, he was getting, going in the time I was getting out. <clears throat> but he has the opportunity to be like a, like a bigger brother, just a little bit, knows a little more about the world, and can encourage those around him. And uh, I think God used him in just exactly what he said he would. And uh, he's encouraged those around him. They've had the Lord discuss in like small Bible study when they allowed him on Sundays, which was kind of almost a miracle in itself. But they were given time to do that. But um, anyway, he's done well, and we appreciate everybody's prayers. And, and uh, he, he won't get to come home like most Marines and for generations have done after this camp. And then he's going to need a lot more prayer. They've changed things on him several times for him and all the other Marines. They No Marines in history has had to go through two weeks of isolation quarantine until 2020. And then they're, gonna, they're changing if they're going to go from 9 to 16 weeks and redoing like everything in the Marine Corps. So now he's, instead of getting to come home, he's going to have to go through another 16 straight weeks of like infantry school. And then, uh, and then maybe he'll get to come home to the spring. So he'll need more prayer. Infantry school is probably harder than boot camp. But he just, he doesn't know that. <laughs>
sent us and put us through trials, but his time's coming and he knows it, so he's going to try his hardest. He's going to lose. Yep, that's right, he's going to lose. Every time I sing that, I just think about the victory that, you know, when that, like Mark talks about on Easter, when, when, that, when that face covering yeah. just started having breath, and it just gets me excited. Amen, you should. <laughs>
But at that moment, I asked myself, would I be ready if the Lord had come that second? And I did. I had to check myself and think back. Amen. God searched my soul. Find me anything in there that's going to hinder me and keep me from being there that day. And remove it. But I do. And I say, and I witness to people about it. But it was. It was real. I checked myself. And I know God was all in there. And I praised him this morning. And I had to give testimony to that because I just, I want to be there. I want to be part of it. And I do. Amen. If there's anything in my way, in my path, anything I say or do, Lord, remove it. Amen. 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 I might be glorified him in the things I do when I say. Amen. 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 There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all were to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And it was so that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even into Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And they all, and all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told unto them. How many of you have heard that story before? Like everybody probably should have already heard that story, right? Is that what you thought it was going to be? Nothing? Jesus, when he was born, yeah. We're celebrating Christmas this week, right? How many of you are excited for Christmas? So apparently, what? You're gonna cry. You're gonna cry. All right. Okay. Well, I have a, I have a present here. I need someone need to come help me open it up. Would you come on up here? Anyone help? Thank <laughs> you. 
It's the look of disappointment. It was awesome. Please show us. What is it? Listen, but it's just an object lesson. It's not for anybody in particular. Can you take it out for me and show everybody? It's baby Jesus. <laughs> I love kids' corners so much <laughs> This is baby Jesus. We're going to celebrate Jesus' birthday. This is like the best gift that the entire world could have. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't have the opportunity to go to heaven. So on Friday, when you celebrate Jesus and you celebrate his birthday, I want you to remember it's not about us. It's not about how many gifts we get or how many presents we don't get. It's about Christ. And I want you this week to think of someone, maybe a friend, maybe a family member that doesn't know Jesus, and maybe tell them the Christmas story and tell them why Jesus came. He came because he loves us, he died for us, and he wants us to be in heaven with him. So remember, Friday, it's not about us. It's about Jesus, and we need to remember him. We need to celebrate him. We need to praise him for being willing to come. He didn't have to, but he loves us so much that he came and he died for us. And if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have any help. But thank God he came for us, right? You guys did a great job listening today. Yes? Am I going to, I can't go to junior church? No. <laughs> Are you ready to preach? Yes, ma'am. Okay, fourth grade and under can come with me for junior church today. Here. No, I got my big boys. They got like all the all I just saw that and I thought, yep.
So actually, just so you know, next year when we have weird Christmas sweater or whatever we call the service service, and you get online because you're like, you know what, Brother Mark or Brother Paul's not about anything on me this year. If you go to buy something, buy like three sizes bigger than what you wear. <laughs> That's the same size as my normal suit jacket that I can button. If I button that thing, you all in the front, you may not live through the service. <laughs> but it came with, it, it's a full suit. It came with pants. Oh, oh, oh. Where are they? Oh, you want to know where they are? <laughs> because when I put them on, they didn't look like pants. Look, <laughs> 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 you find all that Christmas spray paint, Brother Mark? <laughs> If you don't pay this much attention, we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, one? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, <laughs> good? Too much? Not enough? Good enough? It's too much. It's too much. You guys should answer the last question. Joshua chapter 1. You going to take care of it? No, I'll take care of it. Hey, you guys been hearing the crazy echo that's like yeah. comes in part way through? Last week I heard it and it was right when I was making a really important point. And I felt that from the Lord. <laughs> Better? Okay. Probably don't need to do it. <coughs> You know, I was thinking this morning. My, my own tie is distracting me. That is hilarious. What's that? <laughs> I was thinking this morning come in here, and I'm, I'm thankful for a lot of things, and whenever someone asks for a testimony, I always feel a little bit guilty about not giving a testimony, because I have so many things to be thankful for, uh, but one of the things I'm thankful for is our church. Um, I'm thankful for each and every one of you. I'm thankful for what God's put together here at the Fountain of Life. Uh, I'm thankful that we have an a open and free church, where if you want to testify, you can testify. If you want to shout, you can shout. Uh, believe it or not, every once in a while somebody will get good and stirred up in the Lord and maybe even run, and that's okay. If, uh, if you're being led by the Spirit of the Lord, I'm not going to get in your way. But I'm thankful for that, but I'm most thankful this morning that I'm saved. Um, yeah. The greatest thing you can be in this life is saved. And I got a mediocre response at best from a church full of Christians. I say here this morning, uh, what am I going to testify about? And I thought, I'm saved? Right. Uh, well, I can't just get up and say, yeah, I'm thankful I'm saved. Why, why couldn't I? That's like the greatest testimony you can have. I, I'm not being saved. I'm not going to be saved. I'm saved. Right. I'm saved. I'm born again, bought by the blood, saved. If I fall over dead right now, Please don't bury me in the Christmas suit. You know what? Go for it. Get a little tape recorder with Mary Did You Know going. Because and... I'm not going to be in here anymore. I am thankful this morning that I am bought by the blood, born again, been set free. I'm a new man. I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm thankful for that. Uh, Joshua chapter 1 this morning. Look at probably one of the best pep talks I've ever read in the Word of God. Because I believe we need, as a church, we need a pep talk. Yes. Before we do, Brother Zach, would you please pray for the sermon? Oh, graciously, Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day to praise you. That you gave us life, no matter what's going on in this world, that we're saved. And that if we're not saved, you can always find you. You never leave us, you never forsake us, you never forget about us. Lord, we just thank you for that grace and that peace and that mercy. Lord, we just ask you to use Brother Mark's mouth as your mouthpiece. Give him a message for each one of our hearts as you see fit. Lord, allow our eyes and our ears to be attentive and open to your word. Salt in our hearts, Lord. Look inside our hearts. Remove all the deceit and the wickedness and the callousness and the blackness and, and remove that and allow us to focus our eyes on you and the things above and not the things of this world today, Lord. Bless those that are here. Bless those that are paying attention online, Lord. Bless those that are sitting at home and and they're lost in this world, and they don't know, and they're consumed by wickedness and depraved minds. God, just touch their hearts. 
and open their eyes today, Lord. It's in your name. Amen. 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 Verse 1 says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass. You know, I've heard Christians uh, open argument or conversation talking about the two witnesses that show up at the end of, of time here and they decide, you know, who they are. And I've heard great arguments, but one argument I've always heard is, well, we don't really know if Moses died. <laughs> now after the death of Moses. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. I pretty well clears up that argument right there. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over to the Jordan, bow and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Now, when we find Israel at this point in Joshua, they're just coming out of a 40-year stay in the wilderness that they didn't have to have. They, 40 years before this, they could have already went in. This promise is called the promised land, and if I'm going to break that down in a term you can understand, it's a land that had been promised. You got that? It's pretty tough. This is land that had been promised, a promised land. All the way back to Abraham, God made this promise. And here they go, and they send these spies in, and I go see what's in there. And these spies go in there, and they come back, and there's a couple of them, Joshua and Caleb. It's like, yes, this place is awesome. You know, the Bible says that they, they have a stick, and between two of them, they carry one cluster of grapes. <laughs> two men carry one Oh, I want some of those grapes. <laughs> now, can you imagine? Two men, a big old and they come bringing these things back. <laughs> what are the grapes? Look, aren't you the one that wondered about the water? I wanted to know about the house. Yeah. <laughs> and they come back and they've got all this great stuff, and then the other guys are like, yeah, that stuff's there. But there's giants. There's giants there. I'm telling you, we, we don't need to go because there's giants. There's giants over there. Let me, let me explain to you, there were no giants there. This is after the flood. And what, and what they were actually making a reference to is in the Bible where it says the sons of men, or the sons of God got with the daughters of men. I'm not getting into that because it's really confusing, but it says in, in, the, in those days there were giants in the land. And it was actually talking about that line. And so what they had seen was not giants, maybe big men, but it was exaggerated. What Satan did was he came in and he took away their promise. It was already theirs, Brother Mark. It, it wasn't like they had to go in and, and try to beg and plead for it. It was already theirs to get. Yet they focused on the wrong thing. And I thought, man, what a perfect example of where we're at today. In the church today, where we're at. I have never seen so many downhearted, downtrodden, depressed Christians in my life. Ever since one day in November, it's like our world ended. My hope is not in Donald Trump. My hope is not in the Republican Party. I'll go farther than that. My hope is not in the United States of America. My hope is in Jesus. Yeah, amen. That's good stuff. That's where our hope is. In the same way, we're being deceived that these spies were being deceived. Our focus is on things that should not be on. Oh, no, the election was stolen. Oh, no, we might lose our rights. Yeah, we might. But just maybe God's looking down and saying, man, for such a blessed nation, for a land that I set aside for Christian people, what a sorry church you've become. I can't even get you to go to church. I give you a place where you can worship me freely, and it's a battle to even get you to go. And when you do go, you watch the clock the whole time. When you do go, you spend more time wishing the preacher would preach on this, or wishing they would sing this song, or wishing the sound was better, or wishing we had better chairs, or wishing there was more testimonies, or less testimonies, or the service was shorter, or longer. What a sorry church. Why? 
Because we're focusing on the wrong thing. Amen. These spies acknowledge, yes, there's good things. It is truly the land that flows with milk and honey. It is a beautiful land. I acknowledge these grapes are huge, but these guys are monsters. I know we don't need to, they need to see they were able to talk to the rest of the children of Israel. How'd it go? And God, God said, what? All right. If you're 20 years old and up, you're not going. You're going to die in this wilderness. And it makes me wonder how many of us are missing out on blessings because we're focusing on the wrong thing. Yes. But let me just give you a truth this morning. Are you ready? COVID-19 is not going anywhere. Right. right? If you're waiting for one moment of time where you wake up and poof, it's all gone, that will never happen. I've heard people say, I can't wait for it to get back to normal. It's there. This is normal. We're not going to get back to how it was. We can't focus all of our energy on this one bad thing. This is what happens to people in church. Brother Raymond, this is how we lose church people. Right. They'll get in and they'll notice one thing. They go, I'm wearing girl socks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing mismatched girl socks. <laughs> they'll find one thing, right? I ain't going to no church where a preacher wears this the first time in my entire life I've worn girl socks. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, I feel pretty. <laughs> One thing, right? We'll focus on that one little bitty thing, and it'll get a hold of you, and that's all you can think about. There could be 99 great things about the church you're going to, but if there's just one bad thing, or there's 99 great things in your life, and there's one bad thing, and all your focus goes on that. That's where we've gotten to as Christians. Listen, this is the promised land. This is the children of Israel that God had brought out of bondage. And he said, oh, i got a land prepared for you. Woo, it is a great place. It's flowing with milk and honey. Did you see the grapes? Did you see them? Yeah, I don't know, though. Them boys said there's some big old boys over there. I'd almost rather stay out here in the wilderness. Listen, I'm a fan of Mr. Trump. I'm a fan of religious liberty. Right. That's why I'm a fan of him. He fought for it. Yeah. But if it takes us losing that to wake up the bride of Christ, then I'm a fan of that. Right. If it takes us losing a little bit of the rights that we had, if it's a little bit of a smack in the face for us to realize, hey, you know what? It's time for us to man up and be the Christians we're supposed to be, then I'm a fan of that. <laughs> Because there's good things that we've been promised. They didn't want to work for it, Anthony. I thought it was just this generation that we got that way. They had kindergarten graduation clear back then. They didn't want to work for it. You know, if they would have walked in and, oh, hey, God, we'll leave. This is all yours. They would have won. But instead, they died in the wilderness. Forty years later, old Moses dies. God takes care of his body. And Joshua says, hey, I went. Boys, I went. I was there. I know what's good, and I know it. And God said, hey, Joshua, now's the time. Now's the time for you to go get what's promised you. So Joshua was given this task to get the church excited. He's a preacher. He's given this task to take a bunch of church people and try to get them to do something. <laughs> I can relate to that. No, God says, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. Not, I will give this to you. It's already yours. That's the mindset that we got to get back. It's already been given to us. We're going to skip over real quick before we go here. Let's go over to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 9. It's Christmas. Let's read a Christmas scripture. Prophecy. From Isaiah. Very familiar scripture. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Listen to this. This is Isaiah. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born, Isaiah's given this prophecy, and he gives it to us. He said, Unto us a child is, is born and is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Where's 
should our trust be? You know, I, I look around and I've seen everybody unite and there's Trump flags everywhere. Oh, yeah, all right. Woo, that's good. And I hear people say, I don't care if you didn't win, I'm not taking it down. Good for you. What about putting up a Christian flag? Mr. Trump will have these big rallies, Chris. It's like revival. He gets thousands of people to come, and they're shouting, and they're excited, and they're the same kind of people that say, I ain't going to no shouting church. I ain't going somewhere, and then people get to shout and carry on. Just shout for Trump and not for Jesus? I'd be all right if we all start got us some Jesus flags and we raised them up and said, you know what, I'm not taking that down. I don't care what anybody says. I'm not taking that down. Why? Because the government is on his shoulders. He said, hey, Isaiah said, you know what's going to happen? There's this guy who's going to come. He's going to be born, and it's going to be good for you. The government's going to be on his shoulders, and he's going to be in control. His name shall be called one. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Hey, you understand that, that that's happened already? Right. When Isaiah was, was laying this out, that had not happened. This was prophecy. That prophecy that became fulfilled when Jesus was born. That means he's there, Anthony. Right. That means we don't have to sit and wait for this guy to come. He already did. Yeah. He already came. He already set up the government. He's already said, I am the mighty God. I am the Prince of Peace. He's still the same guy today. That's right. We have that promise. But we don't live like we have that promise. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm just I'm scared. I hear people say, I'm, I'm really scared of what's gonna happen. Huh. You know what I am? I'm a little bit excited about it, Brother Paul. <laughs> that sounds a little crazy to say, but I'm a little bit excited about it because the way I see it for the last 40 years, the church has been in the wilderness. The last 40 years, the church has just been going about its business. Well, we have service, then we don't have service. Then we have service, and we go home. And that's just what we do. That's what church is. And now things are getting shaken up a little bit. God said, hey, we need you to start a church. All right, Lord, I need a building. He said, no, you don't. What are you talking about? He said, things are going to be difficult. He said, you don't have to worry about bringing some titles with you. You don't need to worry about getting a whole other separate book full of rules. I gave you one. There's 66 of them. They'll work. You can use those. <clears throat> but I need you to be ready. I said, well, that sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit excited about what may be coming. Do I want to go have church in one of your basements? Not really, but I will. If that's what it takes. If we have to change the name of this to not a church service, to a pottery class, then we'll have a Jesus pottery class. <laughs> Whatever we need to do, because we're in the time. But don't get scared of it. Don't get depressed, because we have the promise that there's something great Amen. right around the corner. Amen. We are living in exciting times. So here's Joshua, and he's got the task. You go back over to Joshua 1. He's got the task of getting the people excited about going across the river. These people that, that are so easily talked out of it, and, and God said, all right, I need you to get the people. I need you to talk them into crossing the river. You know what God's people need to be talked into do today? We need to be ready to cross the river. But we're the kind of people today that you get up there, it ain't going to take a river to stop God's people today. It'll take a mud puddle. A mud puddle? I'd have to walk around it. I'm not knowing there's a mud puddle there. Joshua had to get him talked into crossing the river. Verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. And I was with Moses, and I shall be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. That's God's pep talk to Joshua. You know what God has to do with me every Sunday morning before I can get up and talk to you? He has to give me a little pep talk. Last week he come down and he just said, I love you. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. He said, I do. I love you. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. He gave me a pep talk, and he got me excited. This morning, he said, hey, you know what you are? I said, what am I? He said, you're saved. Amen. I said, amen. That's good. I said, yeah, I know. 
You're saved. You don't have to go to hell, Brother Mark. Yes, I don't have to go to hell. He gave me a pep talk. He said, you've got something to get excited about. You can stand up in front of the church this morning in your girl socks, and you can preach about the fact that you don't have to go to hell. The socks might make it there, but I don't have to go to hell. <laughs> Steph will name this sermon Girl Socks, guarantee it. <laughs> God gave him a pep talk. He said, hey, Joshua, there's not going to be any man that can stand against you. Hey, Christian. Hey, brother and sister in Christ, that the Holy Spirit lives inside. There's no man that can stand against you. You got that? There's no man that can stand against you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. That's good stuff this morning. That's why God said, I've got a pet talk for you. No man that you try to come against can stand against you. What a pet talk. Right, Joshua's like, he's the pastor of the biggest whining church there ever was, and he's got to try to get him across the river and do some fighting. And God's like, hey, nobody. I don't care if they're huge. I don't care if they're tiny. I don't care if they're the greatest king you've ever seen. Nobody's going to stand against you. He says, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. There's a truth you can hang your hat on this morning. Listen. I will fail you. I cannot make that clear enough to you. You'll have a birthday party. You'll have something going on. Brother Mark won't make it there. I'll forget to tell you happy birthday. You may come in and I may not even acknowledge you're here on a Sunday morning. There'll be something I do where you'll feel like I failed you. You know why? I'm human. God is not bound by that. Amen. Yeah, amen. Aren't you glad God is not like us? God said, hey, I won't fail you. Listen, I, I know it's hard for people, and, and we get burnt in life, and, and some people can't trust people. And it makes it hard to get them to trust God because they've been burnt so many times by so many different people, and they just finally put up a wall and say, I can't trust anybody. You may not be able to trust anybody, but you can trust him. That's a truth this morning. He said, I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. I, I'm not going to leave you. I'll love you straight to hell if that's what it takes. But I'm not going to leave you. Be strong and of good courage. For in this people shall thou divide for an inheritance in the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous. That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. That thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. You want the key to prosperity? It ain't in a football stadium. Mm -hmm. Catch that one. You want the key to prosperity? You want a key to a prosperous life? Don't listen to some smiley preacher. Listen to what God said. God said, here's the key to prosperity right here. Here's the key to having a prosperous life. He said, I want you to be very strong and courageous. I want you to, do, to observe according to the law which my servant Moses commanded. He said, I want you to turn not from the right or to the left. Stay on that straight and that narrow. I don't want you to tweak my word. I don't want you to ignore my word. I don't want you to take a little bit here and a little bit there. Don't turn from it, but keep your eyes laser focused on it. Stay on that straight and narrow, and you know what you'll have? You'll be prosperous. Does that mean you're going to be loaded? No. That's garbage theology. That is not the word of God. But it means you'll be prosperous. Listen, you, you might have all the money there is, but someday you're going to die. You know what's going to happen to your money? It'll divide your family up. That's what will happen to your money. That prosperity he's talking about is not something that moth and rust can corrupt. He's talking about an eternal prosperity. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate there in day and night. Whoa. Oops. It was a really good pep talk there for a second, wasn't it? I mean, things was looking good. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to fight your battles for you, Joshua. I'm going to be right there with you like I was with Moses. 
you know, if you stay on me and you keep your eye on the straight and narrow and you follow my law, you're going to have a prosperous life. And I want you to read the Bible and be in the Word day and night. Huh? <laughs> you say Sunday mornings for an hour? No. No, he said, I, I, I want you to take the book. And I don't want it to depart out of your mouth. I want you to meditate on it. Day and night. I want everything you do to be revolved around it. If you're doing dishes, I want you thinking about the Word. If you're mowing the yard, I want you thinking about the Word. If you're helping your kid with homework, I want you thinking about the Word. If you're crossing that river and pulling your sword out to fight, I want you thinking about that Word. This isn't me. This isn't my advice. This is God. Thou may observe and do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. What a promise. Have you ever struggled really hard to get just laser focused on the TV show? It's really hard to make time to watch that TV show you really like, right? Such a battle. No, it's not. Why? Because you put everything else on the back burner. I have had people say to me, I gotta go. I gotta get home by whatever time my show's coming on. Oh, thanks. Makes me feel pretty important. Do you have any problem with that? There's a term now called binge watching, right? Because we live in a generation where you can get on Netflix and you can watch a whole season. No commercials. And we can get on there for hours and do that. When's the last time you binge read? When's the last time you said, I just can't get out of the Word? I tried to put it down and I, and I can't. It's just so exciting. Listen, this is the best movie there ever was. It's the best story that there ever was. There's fighting in there. There's romance in there. There's all kinds of miracles in there. But we don't meditate on that like we do on Netflix, do we? And it don't cost you $7 a month. <laughs> God said, if you focus on this, you get your life wrapped around my word. That'll bring you prosperity and success. Why is this so hard? Because our enemy, the same enemy that took those spies and said, look at the size of those guys. Who do you think they heard those words? He didn't want them crossing that river, Anthony. All those boys, 20 years old and up, never seen the promised land. <clears throat> land that was promised to them. God's will was for them to get in that promised land. That's what he wanted. It wasn't his will. And the Bible said it's not his will that any man should perish. He didn't make them in their mother's womb and say, you know what I want for you? I want you to die in the wilderness. Oh, I just love it. If you fulfill what I want for you and you die in the I feel like there's so many people today that are dying in the wilderness. Because we're not brave enough to cross the river. Because we can't let go of something that's got a hold of us. We can't just die hard, get in and focus and get wrapped around his word and say, you know what? If I got to let go of something, like my brother stood up and said, hey, create in me a clean heart, Lord. If there's something in me that's keeping me from going, fear. Oh, they spent the last 40 years of their life living in the desert. Because they were too afraid to claim something that was promised to them. You have a promise. You understand that? Listen, you have a promise this morning. We don't live like it. We run around like those other spies saying, oh, those men are too big or there's too much going on or I, I, I can't because of this and I can't because of that. 
The greatest gift that could ever be given. Nope, not salvation. The Holy Spirit. Jesus left us with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we live like we ain't got anything. Listen, he, he's not a little chihuahua that lives inside of you, right? That if you sneeze, it's going to run and hide with, with his tail tucked. You got a Rottweiler living inside of you. The Holy Spirit, he ain't afraid to fight. He's like, oh, I see a challenge. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's do this. Oh, things are going to get tough. All right, it's about time we do something for the Lord. And we walk around like we got a little kitty cat in there. I don't know. I don't know if we should get involved. Yes, you should get involved. I don't want to die in the wilderness. I don't want to live on the other side of the river and say, boy, it sure looks nice over there. I want to cross it. But we got to get past our fear. we got to start living like you have a promise. You understand what a promise is? Listen, if I stood up here and I said, I promise you this morning, when you walk out of the church, you meet me at the door, I'm going to give each one of you a $100 bill. You know how many of you would actually be here after church going, hey, hey, preacher, really enjoyed the sermon. That one was spot on. One of the best ones ever. I even like the socks. <laughs> If I promised you that, you should expect it. Right. Just to be clear, I did not. <laughs> I'll high five, fist bump, maybe even give you the girl socks. But I don't have $100 to give you. But if I promised it to you, that means it's coming to you, right? That means it's going to be yours. There's a promise that we have as Christians. God's in control. The same pep talk that he gave to Joshua, he's given to us. He said, hey, lift up your heads. You still live in the greatest country in the world, do you not? Right. You still have freedom, do you not? Right. You're still able to go to your house of worship and lift up your hands. If you can get over your fear and do it just a little bit. You still have that freedom. Right. Start walking like it. Yeah. You didn't lose the Super Bowl. We win. We don't have to have a great... Here's our halftime talk. We win. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that, right? If you're the coach and you say, all right, boys. We won. Cool. You can flip right over to Revelation. You know what's going to happen one day when the old accuser's up there running his mouth? An angel's going to stand up, and you know what he's going to say? I love this. Shut up! That's what he's going to say. He's going to be running his mouth, trying to accuse each and every one of us that are born-again believers, and he, the old angel's going to say, shut up! Enough! And then they're going to grab a hold of him. Yeah, yes. Amen. They're going to grab a hold of him. Listen, I'm looking, I want popcorn. I'm going to be right there on the sidelines. I'm going to be like, yeah, I remember what you told me. Ha! Who's saying it now, buddy? They're going to shut him up, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to shut up. Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, why? He has to. Yes. Right. The girls sang a song this morning. There wasn't any boys up there this morning, was there? <laughs> what kind of bad it was. The girls and whoever sang a song this morning... About he has no equal, he has no rival. Listen, Satan is not his rival. Satan is not all knowing, he's not all powerful. When the angel tells him to shut up, he will shut up. And they're going to take him, and they're going to bind him, and they're going to throw him into a pit. And he's going to stay in there for a while, and then they're going to put him out into a worse place a lake of fire. Yes. That's a promise, church. Right. We win. Yeah. Listen, we, we win. Hey, November may not have went the way you wanted it to go. The COVID may not be going the way you want it to go. Your family may not be in a spot the way you want it to be. But listen, we still win. It still ends in amen. Yeah, yeah praise God. It ends in amen. Right. He will be bound. He will be tossed in the lake of the fire. And he will not have to tempt us anymore. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more party. There's going to be the last tears you ever cry. Yeah. 
The last tears that ever flow down your face. You know who's going to wipe them away? God himself. The God that's so great, that's got so much glory, that if he showed up right here, right now, and you looked at him, you'd die. That's the truth. You can't even look upon him. Moses spent some time with him, and he glowed. He physically had a glow to him. And Moses... You got something going on there, man. <laughs> you're glowing. You got to, like, seriously put something over you. You're, gl you're glowing. Oh, man, I read that the first time as a new believer. I'm like, oh. <laughs> God's that great that Moses just spent a little bit of time with him? I, I mean, I think about Moses coming down off the mountain. Man, it's right out. That God. That God someday. You might sit in the front desk, but <laughs> it'd have been awkward if it was anybody but you. Yeah. That same God. In the same way I'd wipe the tears off my baby's face. Come on, just cry a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a last tear. It ever flows down your face. Mm -hmm. In the hand of God. Yeah. He's going to say, that was it. More. We don't need those anymore. Those aren't needed here. Man, we got something to get excited about, church. We, we don't need dorky Christmas sweaters. We've got Jesus. He is the reason for the season. Listen, we need to get start having a little bit more. Puff your chest out a little bit. Get some pride about you. That's one thing you're going to notice when Trevor comes home. Those of you that know Trevor, I've seen it with Zach. Walk different. He talked different. There was respect that came out of his mouth. The posture. <laughs> Puffed out a little bit. That's how we should be. Not in an arrogant way, but you're a child of a king. That's right. You're born again believers. We have a great day coming, and it's coming right around the corner. Lift up your heads. Get some joy about you. Man. We're supposed to be the, the, the light of the world. We need some of that glow that Moses had. Amen. How contagious is that? We're supposed to convince people they want what we have? Listen, if we look the same as them, <laughs> brother, you don't look the same as them. <laughs> <laughs> and if we're running around with our head down and we're just as depressed as everybody else in the world, where's their hope going to be? Right. They're not going to look to us and say, oh, they've got what I need. That's what they should be saying. That's when we, we should be standing up and testifying and saying, man, I got a lot going on, preacher. I'm telling you what, there's trials galore in my life, and I thank God for them. Oh, I want to hear those testimonies. I want, you know what? First time. First time in my Christian life, I witnessed that. You know, Shelby, last week. I talked to her before church and she was telling me she had the biggest smile on her face. Uh, she got something great to say. And the next thing she said was, this was the worst week I think I've ever had in my life. And she told me and she had this, this huge smile on her face. And God started to reveal to me, there it is right there. Count it all joy. That's that testimony you keep talking about. You've never heard anybody do it. There it is right there. God bless you, sis. That's how it should be. Amen. She got something out of it, right? Yeah. And I seen that, and it was a witness laid unto me. I said, praise God. We can get through it. Let me take church. We can get through it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what you got to do is decide, are you going to cross the river with us? Because mm -hmm. the fountain of life is going to cross the river. Yeah. 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 We're going to move for Jesus. 
You know why? We don't have time to sit around. Get out there and be light to somebody. <laughs> Part of some of his beard. <laughs> I don't even know what they call those. Beard jingles? Beard bling. That'll work. What is it? Beard bling. Beard bling. <laughs> hey. It's going to be okay. The church needs to hear that. You have brothers and sisters in Christ that are, that are just so wrapped up in everything going around and they forget that there's still hope in Christ. It's going to be okay. Listen, it's time for us to let our light shine. It's time for us to get out there and start witnessing the people. Yes. Let's lead people to the Lord. Yes. You know, there's no greater feeling. There's no greater experience when you see somebody surrender their heart and life to Jesus. Yes. You say, well, how many people have you led to the Lord? How many people have you got saved, preacher? None. Not a single one. Not even this one. I can't save anybody. It's not. The Bible didn't say, and it's the mark that called him. <laughs> and it's the mark that lead him. No. The Spirit does that. But I can tell you, I've had the absolute pleasure of being beside and praying with several people that surrendered their heart to Jesus. And there's nothing like it. Amen. Hey, the other side of this, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, I would be scared. Because it is going to get bad. See, so somewhere along the line, the church has forgotten. We have scripture to tell us that it's, it's going to get bad. Famine. Famine's coming. Famine like we've never seen. You think the world's evil will make them hungry. You should be scared. So are you trying to scare me into being saved? No. I'm just telling you, you have the right to be scared if Jesus is not your Savior. I would be. But you can still do something about that this morning. Because he's still calling. He's still offering. As we stand.